Hi, pals. We just want to give you a quick heads up before you get this episode started. We ran into a significant technological problem, and in that I mean I didn't realize there was another microphone connected to the system, and so it picked up mine and Melissa's audio on this third microphone separate from our recording area. So it really sounds like we're in a conference and not in front of our normal microphones. But we did have a great episode to go with the heat, so we didn't want to lose this entire episode. So what we're doing is we're putting this episode into the feed, rough audio and all, but we think it's a great episode of our podcast. You can still listen to it. You can still understand what everyone's saying. Like I was saying, it's like listening to if we were at a conference. Just wanted to warn you before we got the episode started, we're sorry for the bad audio this week. We do encourage you to stick around and listen to this episode because we have a ton of fun. Also deals with a very dark topic. So again, sorry for the bad audio this week. Uh, be sure to check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com, and you can get the updates on when the next episode is going to come out. Or we'd love to hear your feedback, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Thanks again for subscribing. Thanks again for listening. And without much further ado, here is Go With The Heat, Season 4, Episode 5, Miami Vice episode titled Child's Play. Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. We're back after a week off. I promise you we'd be back after just one week. And not the the feeling I had was like, what if we just have one more week? Yeah, come on. Another week would be okay. <laughs> this week we're talking about season four, episode five, titled Child's Play. It originally premiered on October 30th, 1987. Almost another Halloween episode. Almost. This was not Halloween themed. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this has nothing to do with Halloween. <laughs> it is written by Priscilla Turner. Now, I'm going to challenge you to find anyone with less information than Priscilla Turner on the Miami Vice wiki page. <laughs> I challenge anyone out there to go <laughs> click on the link that will be in the show notes. Go check out the show notes. Go to heat.com. Look at the show notes right here. Click on her name. The name of the wiki literally says she wrote an episode of Miami Vice. That's it. That's all we have. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Well, maybe that's her claim person. to fame. Maybe she's working Ellie somewhere and she's telling a story about how Don Johnson was a dick to her once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dick to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Vern Gilliam. Gilliam. Gillum. I'm saying Vern Gillum. He's got four more episodes Gillum. coming. He's also a fairly successful TV director. He, he directed some episodes at Ash Bridges, a few other things. Baywatch? I mean, if you got a director credit on Baywatch, that stands for something, right? I think David Hasselhoff has a lot of those, too. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started projecting this, you'll join each other's lives, guys. It's February. We normally don't talk about the weather in the open here, but you know, I have to say it's just been, it's been so amazing out here in Phoenix. It's like in the high 50s, low 60s, like breeze, slight cloud cover. It's, it's like the perfect weather that we get here in Phoenix. We're supposed to creep up close to 70 next week. Hey, John, what's the weather been yeah, like in Seattle? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're supposed to be going in the spring, and everything was nice, and we were getting close to 50 degrees. Like, like it's about to be spring. And then out of nowhere, bam. 30 degrees in snow, just just snowing <laughs> a whole week. <laughs> it's it's the whole reasons why I look back and go, like, Shadow's so great. And I see pictures of snow. It's like, it wasn't that great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah snow, snow is nice to, to look at, like on the weekend or on vacation, but it sucks. <laughs> to, like, have to do stuff around. What I appreciate Seattle and, and snow is the Seattle drivers who get halfway to work and go like, you know, this is stupid. And they just leave their car in the middle of the freeway <laughs> and just that. walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And you'd be more than one person, too. Multiple people would leave their car in the same way. Like, yeah, screw it. I don't even care about this car anyway. I'll come back oh, in a couple oh, days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was driving some week right as, like, because we the snow came in, kind of went away, and then came back. And when it came back, I was driving somewhere, and I saw someone's car just randomly abandoned on the side of the road. And I was like, it's starting. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it started. People are giving up on their cars, you know. And like, it had only been snowing for about two hours, you know, <laughs> just starting to build up. <laughs> Me. That's it. I can't make it home. It snowed for five minutes. I can't do it. 
what's you... great too is like they abandon their cars and then they call an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The worst that it got around here in the last week is that I was on the road, as I mentioned, and it was a trade show slash industry event that I was going to. And it was giving me a hard time about hand sanitizer and how often I was doing it. But now a whole bunch of people are sick and I'm not. So what's up, losers? <laughs> I don't got the flu. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go talk about this episode and it's non-Halloween themed, which I was hoping for. <laughs> but instead, we got this very dark and serious story that involves Sonny killing a child. <laughs> Kill him. Oh boy, attempted murder. <laughs> <laughs> attempted murder. <laughs> it reminds me of his own son. He attempted to murder him too. Baby. <laughs> Swimmy, uh, swimmy, oh, something like that. Word. <laughs> Let's go talk about this episode. So when we open up, it's in the role Stan was made for. <laughs> <laughs> Being a bum. Being a bum person <laughs> sleeping on a bench. <laughs> <laughs> There's some no good nicks around. Just watching them. They're like, they're, they're just watching. They're like, look at those kids. They're about to roll white tech. They're just going to watch it happen, too. <laughs> I was hoping that was actually going to happen. I wanted to see if it's like cow chipping. Are we just going <laughs> to roll him off of the bus stop <laughs> to the ground? <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> it was the role he was meant to play. <laughs> the duos, as you mentioned, John, are posted up in another room. They're watching from like a, an apartment building down on to where his white tech is, so therefore an arms deal is going to happen. The ladies are working as prostitutes. Everyone's in the right position. The duo are up doing nothing except looking through binoculars. Swite so Tech's a homeless man, and the ladies are working the streets. Just like normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they would be doing their jobs up in the apartment building, but the damn neighbors can't keep their mouths shut. I, I swear, it's just <laughs> making so much noise. It sounds like someone's being slaughtered in, in the room next to them. <laughs> and at first, Sonny just gets up and bangs the wall. He's like, keep it down, you two. And the, other, the guy... Yells back, mind right <laughs> your own business. But eventually, Sonny. You think that's what set Sonny off? Like, he yells back out of your business and says, so like, oh, that's it. I'm going to go kick the door in. <laughs> no, with her screaming and him saying, like, I'm going to kill you. or like, Yeah, yeah. Okay. It starts to escalate. And then Sonny. Leaves. Okay, sure, sure. It was her screaming and it wasn't the guy yelling back at him. Because sure. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they had already called a bus or whatever, like, the regular police to come. They're telling the girls, like, call the regular, call the police to come check on these people next door. So Sonny runs around after he hears some more screaming and it escalates and he kicks in the door, gun drawn, and he sees the man standing over the woman who's on her knees. He's behind her with a knife at her neck. So luckily he did come barging in and you see out of the corner of his eye and out of your eye too, you see a flash of a gun in an open doorway. Sonny turns, fires twice, Aims the gun back at the couple as they're just staring at him. Sonny shuffles over and he looks into the room and he realizes he shot a 13-year-old boy. And Tub shows up late. <laughs> <laughs> so, point out, at no point did Mark identify himself as law enforcement. He simply said, freeze. So he did not say he was police or anything. And what are you doing shooting through a wall, Sonny? <laughs> Sonny mistakes that freeze and I'm a police officer listen to me all the time. It turns out they're not interchangeable. He never said anything. He just freeze. <laughs> this is a real tough situation for Sonny though because he has grounds. He comes in. He sees someone going to kill another person. He sees a gun pop out from the doorway. He, shoot, he turns and shoots. And he also, where he shot because it was a child, he shot the child in the chest in reality, if it was an adult, that was a non-fatal shot. Yeah. Too. And it did end up being with the kid. It was a non-fatal shot, too. But Right in the heart, though. It, yeah. Right in the heart. <laughs> yeah. So was he like, if the, he thought like it was a normal-sized person and he was like trying to shoot him in the jimmy? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> right in the jimmy. It doesn't kill you, but your life is miserable. <laughs> <laughs> And then we go to the opening credits. Now, we're going to stop right here because we do have our first two guest stars that happen. They are playing Annette and then Monroe, who are going to be our two, pretty much the 
protagonist, except for Sonny, to deal about the rest of the episode. Yeah, so we have the return of Ving Reigns as Walker Monroe. You would remember him from the episode The Maze, where he played Georges. And we already talked about Ving to to quite an extent, you know, from movies from like Pulp Fiction. He was in all of the Mission Impossible movies. A little known fact, he is the only other person other than Tom Cruise in all of the Mission Impossible movies. But we also have Denitra Vance, who plays Anita Callister, and she actually got her start uh, Saturday Night Live as a cast member from 85 to 86. She was actually the first African-American female regular cast member on the show. She would leave after a year uh, and do some TV and some movies like Limit Up. Hanging with the homeboys or jumping at the boneyard. Some big movies there. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. There's some close up shots of each person giving their deposition of what happened. Sonny keeps going back to, like, I should have known. I should have known there was going to be a kid in there. The mom's explaining that she had the gun for protection. He must have been trying to protect her from the man that was in the house. And the man's like, I'm sorry. Like, hey, shit happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Sonny totally sounds rehearsed. I, I think people are getting their stories straight. I don't trust him. But I'm calling BS on the fact that, like, like they're not suing or nothing, or you just killed your kid. Yeah, I know. Like, it's it's everything around them is very weird. Also, once again, he's not dead. He's <laughs> saying he killed him. He's not dead. <laughs> He doesn't die at the end. Seriously maimed. Yeah, okay, so he's seriously maimed, but he's not dead. (laughs) Shot him in the heart. He's still alive. He's at the hospital, but they got gauze with X's over his eyes. (laughs) 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 Hey, by the way, (laughs) I love how dramatic Bearded Tubbs is in his interview. Like yelling and being all, all like, like super dramatic in it. Like everyone else is like just doing the interview, and then like they shoot the tubs. Do you know what it's like being a cop, man? <laughs> he was upset. He's got emotions. He loves crooked. <laughs> the mom, her name is Annette, and she's been arrested a bunch for prostitution. And so Gina's telling or Castillo that the son and the mom, I'm sorry, the son and the, and the man Monroe, they don't have any any information on them. They kind of don't know who they are. The gun's probably stolen. And it's kind of weird that the gun is like a military issue handgun. And Dad says, well, report it to the ATF. Let's see where that goes. Dad also says that he'll take care of Sonny. And Sonny comes walking in and he kind of tells him, you have to talk to this shrink. You have to. And Sonny says, no, I don't. And he just leaves. And everyone just lets him leave. <laughs> yeah, he was not being a very strict dad in this episode. He's like, well, I don't really want you here. Uh, I don't have the heart to tell you that. So, well, I, I think there's like something to this. I, I think there's something to this because a little bit later, they do some some pretty successful police work. And then a little bit later after that, some pretty bad police work. And there seems <laughs> to be a common theme. <laughs> Also, John, I, if you want to point out your appreciation and mine, I share in that in Tubbs' like, assertiveness in this, and I think it's that leather jacket. I know. bringing it out of him. Look, yeah. <laughs> that leather jacket and that purple shirt he's got on. Uh, 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 it's the beard. It's the beard. Ever since he put that beard on, he's a different man. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying that because I don't think that was a real beard. <laughs> was he wearing an earring? <laughs> Maybe. Rogue. <laughs> Ever since he wanted his damn money, Tubbs has been different. <laughs> so now we head over to the hospital. The duo shows up. It gets alive, a shot in the heart, as we mentioned. And the, what's great <laughs> is Sonny's insistent <laughs> that the, the kid get taken care of and be basically put into the quote unquote presidential suite. If this was the president, how would he take care of him? Also, why is he berating this yes. poor doctor? Who says nothing but like we'll take care of him the best? It doesn't matter that he's got no money. We don't care about that. We're gonna take care of him like we do everyone else. And so you're like, no, I want you to treat him better than everyone else. I want you to treat him like a president. Not just that. Like when he first comes in, the doctor's like, yeah, well, he's alive, but he's, we'll see how long that lasts. You know, and somebody's like, like, yeah. like That's why we put those ready to leverage his boat. <laughs> and, and he's threatening him like he's got an option. Like, don't let him die. You know, or I'm gonna kick your butt. 
<laughs> just make sure that happens. Doc's standing there like, I already told you he's a goner. Like, what do you want me to tell you? <laughs> Tubs at the end. Sonny storms out and Tubbs just pops into the frame for two seconds. He has another jacket on, beard, very intense look. He holds up finger quotes and he goes, the president. And then he leaves. It was like, <laughs> that's it. It, was like, it wasn't even like finger quotes. It was like a peace sign. He was like, the president. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's like the doctor shaking his head like whatever i don't know what's wrong with well i told him <laughs> on their way out the duo running to the girl who's there also at the hospital waiting to see us i'm assuming at this point we're supposed to assume it's his son no, no, it's or someone that son. he raises like his son you yeah. know something like that they do talk about that when they interview her she said no she doesn't know where his dad is he hasn't seen him in a long time mm-hmm. yeah anyways if someone's t- taking better care of their son than a little old Billy or Timmy or whatever Timmy. Sonny's got. <laughs> Monroe stops Sonny and yeah. says, "Hey, don't blame yourself. I understand the situation that you are in. It's not. I'm. I, I forgive you. And uh, I've been going to a social worker. He, he, he gives them a whole sad, sad sack story. He got laid off from the plant. She's been hoeing around. <laughs> it's been a lot going on in that house." <laughs> Sometimes he's been seeing a social worker to help him out. So he just stops and turns around and says, you touch her again, you will need a social worker. And then storms out. Which, I mean, I don't know. What's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I think so it's about that, time we talk about how shooting a kid is a, is a good reminder to spend time with your own kid. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> we head over to Sonny's boat. Sonny's getting whiskey drunk. You know, it's a Tuesday. That's yeah. what he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's watching the news and he looks over to his left and he sees the picture. He's like, oh yeah, I have a son. Who is the kid? <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> Timmy. Stevie. Billy. 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 Stevie. <laughs> Stevie. Stevie. <laughs> Sammy. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> Greg feels right. <laughs> How old is he now? Like two? No, like ten. Oh, that little bugger! <laughs> what are he doing? Drops him uh, off at that farm so he can run. <laughs> 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 so the next morning at the precinct, Sonny is petitioning the vice team for blood, and he's harassing Trudy to give his blood and stuff sports that he memorabilia. Gave her back. <laughs> yeah. what? Wait, let's go back to Trudy dating someone who was a coach for the Dolphins. Like, come on, Trudy. Bring him in. Where's he at? Bring him. <laughs> I'm going to get to something later with Trudy, but she could do an amazing amount of work in that skin-tight miniskirt. Yeah, I know, right? The way she like, runs in her heels and stuff. Gina doesn't pull it off as much. Sonny can't even catch someone going up the stairs. I know. It's like, <laughs> 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 the shoulder pads. It's yeah, weighing them down. It's weighing them down. Yeah. And the hair, the wind is that sits on the hair. It's so on them down. <laughs> <laughs> Dad comes out and tells us he has been another bombing, you know, Miami, and the two arms yeah. dealers that they've been tracking are at war. He says, like, there's been another bombing, like, that makes 10. <laughs> um, and it's what like, holy crap, one? the hell's going on? It, it, is, is Miami turning into a little Bosnia? Like, what the hell's going on there? <laughs> Ten bombings, only one dead hooker. Ten bombings. <laughs> they keep missing. <laughs> just turns out in Overtown, a lot of buildings are vacant. You just blow them up at random. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> uh, uh, Sonny's just kind of watching from afar, too. He's like off in the corner, kicking his feet, listening to what they're talking about. So sad. Like they have him left out over there. He's like, yeah. no, I'm not doing any hard work. I'm just, I got some stuff. I got to be here. I got to finish up. Yeah. Uh, I should be at home, and everyone should tell me to go home. Yeah. I shouldn't be here actually doing work. And later, when the community says he should be suspended, I kind of agree. But I'm going to butt in on this conversation yeah, yeah. when I get frustrated, grab the paper, and storm out. <laughs> and you can see at the next scene that Sonny does need that time away because they go to this bar where a man named Holiday is working. It's one of the arms dealers. And they come in and just hold everyone at gunpoint. Sonny grabs Holiday because he wants to, they're still undercover. So there's Burnett and Cooper. And they were the ones that were supposed to have the buy that fell through the night before. He just busts in, grabs Holiday, and beats the crap out of him. Slams his hand into a pinball machine, starts pistol whipping uh, him. Tubbs finally gets him under control and sends him over to the corner. But man, you know, freaking Whitey over there in the corner is starting problems. 
Like after that, everything's cool. Tubs all business, cool. Everybody's friendly. Everyone but that damn guy in the corner. <laughs> And Tubbs does get the information he wants out of him. Holiday wants to set up another TV one to replace him. He's got some stuff from Chicago. And after a nice civil conversation <laughs> between Tubbs and Holiday, everything was fine. Let's put the pinball business, Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> and walking out, Tubbs gives Sonny a lot of crap for it, too. It's like, you're going too far. I don't know what the hell is going on with you. You should leave. And Sonny freaks out and says, if you can't handle me, why don't you just ask for Zwitek or Z? Listen, I'm sorry. I know <laughs> I went too far. <laughs> by the way, Holland is played by Isaac Hayes, who, singer, songwriter, actor, producer. I mean, he is soul. He is so much soul that one of the his best-known, best-selling albums is called Hot Buttered Soul. <laughs> Another one of his most successful uh, albums was also Black Moses in 71. But he's also known for movie scores as he did the theme to Shaft. He did the actual whole score for Shaft. It even had a cameo in it as a bartender. <clears throat> and that's not the only acting he's been in. He was also in a couple black exploitation movies like Chuck Turner and Three Tough Guys. And he's been in a few newer ones as well. Oh, well. Then I'm gonna get you, sucker. Most recently was in Hustle and Flow. Hayes also was the chef from the show South Park. He played the chef and actually released songs under as the chef. What's great about that role is there's a whole shit generation of people that only know him as chef. They don't know anything. They don't know chef. Yeah, they don't know, know music. They don't know nothing. All they know is he's chef. He wrote one of the most covered songs in history. He wrote Soul Man. Really? I didn't know that he wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote that along with David Porter in the 60s when he was a session artist. Since the 1960s, he's been pounding out music. I mean, he declared bankruptcy in 1976. He actually, he owed $6 million at the time. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> If you're wondering why, how could he vote $6 million in 76? Well, in 74, he bought the uh, American Basketball League, the ABA Memphis Tams, which he changed to the Memphis Sounds. So he actually owned a basketball team. Wow. A semi-pro basketball team. Before we finish up here, Tubbs does say to Crockett that working with him was like holding two volleyballs underwater. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't picture him trying to do that. <laughs> Line up in my face. <laughs> <laughs> we have two real fast scenes. One we see at Annette's place. We see Monroe and Annette. They're not really too broken up about their son being shot. And he's kind of handing her money and also pulling her by her hair and saying, don't mess up our welfare scam. Because she doesn't want to go to the hospital. He's like, you need to go to the hospital and you need to pay the bill. And she's like, I don't like the hospital. Sick people are there. Yeah. It's like, you don't really care about your kid very much, do you? <laughs> starting to think that he's her pimp and that they might not be related to that kid. Yeah, Maybe. something fishy. Oh. And then there's another really fast scene where Sunny Parks has a quick flashback. And then it spins around and starts heading to Atlanta, which is the last time we knew that's where Jerry lived. I mean, Billy. So now Sonny is going to make a surprise appearance at his ex-wife's house. And unannounced, no phone call, didn't call his employer, didn't tell nobody. Just decided to head up and go finally see his son, who he hasn't seen in three years. It's been three years since yeah. he's been up there and to go know, see his son. In the morning, like right when you wake up, that's when you want your ex-husband at the door. Your daddy, <laughs> <laughs> don't pay no child support ex-husband at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's totally got that look on her face, too, where she almost starts to tell him, until I start seeing some child support, you can't just show up like this. <laughs> Why did you call? And he's like, oh, sorry. And I put her. <laughs> she's like, hey, she's really nice for what he did. He's just showing up out of the room and not being a really good dad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's pretty nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> she's really nice, especially when he gets all upset Um, Bobby's new dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he gets a little bent out of shape for 
for no reason. Like um, three years is a long time, and all these people you slept with. What about the junkie? What about the hooker? <laughs> oh wait, I shouldn't matter. Yeah. What about you know? All Which, people? by the way, stepdad Bob, or as I like to call him, Poppy, Poppy <laughs> Bob. He's played by Paris Buckner, who we've also seen in multiple other episodes, and I can only come to the conclusion that Danny's stepdad is a <laughs> is a part time SWAT leader. Is also a prosecutor and a defense attorney when he <laughs> did. So he is a pretty accomplished stepdad. <laughs> and you can see on Sammy's face when he sees Sonny standing in the door and Sonny comes over. And he goes, Billy! <laughs> Who the hell are you? <laughs> and little Georgie turns around and he goes over and he sees his dad and he's like, goes to shake his hand. Because that's what you do to strangers. Yeah, you know, it's nice to see you. <laughs> yes. Good day, sir. How are you? And then out comes the surprise. Uh-huh. There's a man in her house. How could she? How could she be that way? Don't you read the Christmas newsletter, Sonny? Don't you at least do that? Yeah, exactly. You would have known about Poppy Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Which I love this next, and I think we kind of, so we learned that Crockett's favorite thing to do with his son is to let his son drive his Ferrari, which I'm starting to think is the only thing he does with his son. And we get to hear about how his son hopes he's going to be adopted by Poppy Bob soon, as soon as the wedding comes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, first time he gets married. Also, the fact that he's sitting on his dad's lap driving his car down the road. I mean... That's what you do when you're dead be dad. The first thing you do is do something really unsafe with your son, oh, right? Am I, am I the only one that thought that was so creepy? <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one that thinks that's kind of creepy. <laughs> we have a real fast scene where, where we see at the community meeting with the captain, with the police captain, and with Castillo. And the, the community has a good point. Like, suspend him or release his name. Why are you hiding this person who shot a teenager? Yeah, but the police, like she said, like, he was a good shoot and that he had a, he had cause to do it. I mean, this is the one time where Sonny actually I think they should fire police. him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's they need to fire Croc. If we look at, if we look at recent behavior, okay, he helped a murderer get out of jail. He's, he's, He's lost a few of these cases, had witnesses get killed on his watch. I think it's time we fire him. Now he's <laughs> now he's uh, shooting children. <laughs> I mean, they do have a point. He should at least be suspended while they do the investigation. Not let this free wheel and free Yeah, shooting. I mean, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> but not really. Yeah, I mean, release his name. They want his name released. So they could mob him. As Sonny is driving back to work, who he didn't tell he was leaving for an entire day, <laughs> he's having a flashback to the argument he had with Caroline the night before, where they're arguing about the adoption. And I just want to say, Caroline, if you need some fuel, just remember he thought that that junky heroin addict nurse slash doctor that he was dating was more important than spending time with good old Greggy. Yeah, so. <laughs> Oh, by, by the way, I just want to mention that one Billy Bobby movie, <laughs> yeah, Billy, it's played by Clayton Barclay Jones. So and he doesn't have very many credits, but he was in the Lassie movie in '94. <laughs> Unfortunately, not Timmy. He was not Timmy. I think he played Jake. <laughs> also, to point out that it's a different kid than who played. Yeah. Billy, the last time we saw him, in season one, Calderon's Demise, part one. We have not seen Caroline or Billy since then. Actually, not even a mention, except for a passing, like, I'm also a dad, too. Like, yeah, sure, Sonny. Yeah, he never said, like, hey, I spent the weekend with my kid, or hey, I talked to Billy, whatever why he doesn't. That's why he doesn't recognize little David. Caroline is the same person. Belinda Montgomery. Belinda Montgomery is actually a Canadian actress. She actually appeared in a lot of different TV dramas and guest roles. Immediately after her, her next role, after Miami Vice, was playing Doogie Howser's mom. That might be a better role. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> so I have a theory here. So oh, Crockett's ex-wife is Doogie Howser's mom. 
his son is Doogie Howser. <laughs> no, the son, the next son with the special ops DA <laughs> yeah. warrior dad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Caroline and Poppy Bob have Doogie <laughs> Hauser. And so li- little Benny, he, he kind of becomes the black sheep of the family after this. Uh, Belinda Montgomery, uh, the last thing I, I could find her in was 2010's Tron Legacy. So now we're actually going to do some police work here. We're going to bust somebody. Tubbs shows up with Swipe Tech this time instead of unhinged Burnett. <laughs> attack yeah, I, uh, Holiday the last time. <laughs> I, I love that. Tubbs shows up. He's like, hey, Holiday, it's cool. I swapped out my white guys. Like, I got a different one. <laughs> yeah. I got the this one comes with a van. <laughs> <laughs> this one likes cheese a little bit. The other one. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna buy the guns. They do a sample. Switek shoots up a bunch of someone, a bunch of crates that belong to someone else. (laughs) (laughs) And then the team busts in and is able to bring down Holiday. And Tubbs, obviously being Cooper, he's accusing Holiday of setting him up. But Holiday is like, I think it's your other. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You hang out with. He's crazy. Guys, guys, did you believe it? A successful bust? No one was shot? Everything went exactly as planned? The guy was, the bad guy was arrested? What is the difference between these other (laughs) events in which everyone's got to be shot and killed versus the ones when they're successful? It's like, if you remove this one thing from the equation, everything goes smooth. (laughs) I don't know. No. I, I gotta see something else in this episode to see if that validates your point. John. No, I'm sorry, but Switek was there, so <laughs> I can go through with Switek. But if Switek said that means people escape. <laughs> yeah. Also, why do yeah. you need hot dogs? Why witnesses are getting killed? <laughs> We weren't asking him, that's why I take the watch anyone, just the random <laughs> white guy. All he had to do was, like, shoot some guns. <laughs> uh, we do see that they put together, Trudy and Dad put, put together that these guns are the same. What Some of the guns are the same as the handgun that the child that Sonny shot had. So there might be some weird connection here. Well, let's not investigate it any further. No, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a quick driving scene where Stacey, I was still under the impression he was in Georgia because that's where we knew that Billy and Caroline had moved. So in my notes, I wrote, Sonny's leave in Georgia. He lost his soul in a deal to the devil because Sonny isn't much of a fiddle player. <laughs> 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 and Sonny makes a quick stop off at a psychiatrist. He doesn't say anything to him. He just kind of stumbles around in the room. And he has a look on his face like, I'm only here because of my plea deal with the county. Yeah. <laughs> there, dad uh, to go. <laughs> and then we go to the precinct. Sonny walks in. Everyone's working. And they're all like, hey, Sonny, how you doing? How you doing, Sonny? I hope everything's okay. We haven't seen you in 48 hours. Yeah, I hope he you disappeared. <laughs> he gets all angry. He's like, let me tell everybody, I'm okay. <laughs> they're like, geez. Uh, <laughs> Dad gets all up on, you know, yeah. like, why didn't you call? We had game <laughs> night. I, I showed up, I had pretzel sticks. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part of that is that when Castillo calls him to the office, he doesn't even come out of his office, he calls him on the phone. <laughs> He's like, come in my office right now. <laughs> I don't quite get up. That's how mad I am right now. See, that's how a phone works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, this is how it works. You would have called little Timmy. You wouldn't have had to go have a new poppy. <laughs> so great. Don't <laughs> exclude it. I just wanted to make sure you knew how a phone worked. Yeah. It looks like you'd handle it just fine. I mean, you never you called. answered it. <laughs> You call anybody. Into the office with Dad. Dad starts chastising him. Sonny flips out. Like, well, what do you want me to say? Yes, I killed him. I won't take the bullet back. And then Castillo zeroes in and says, you got to suck it up, man. This is part of the job. You And yes, 
It's your bullet, your gun, you pulled the trigger, and you got to live with it, bro. Yeah, well, he also tells him that, they're, that they said it was a good shoot, and he's like, so oh, I'm clear. And he's like, no, you're, you're cleared by, the, by whatever, like, the, the, the upper, the upper, uh, upper people have cleared you, but I haven't cleared you, because you're not over it, and you're not acting right. I, I think they just want to wait until the weekend to fire him. He seems like one of those guys <laughs> yeah. that might snap. <laughs> check yet we gotta wait till friday <laughs> we have a quick stop over at the hospital where the doctor tells sonny who's there visiting with the boy uh little jeffrey as we he's know still him brain now. dead <laughs> <laughs> he's, got he's still a vegetable he's not coming back <laughs> yeah he's his eye patches to <laughs> for fun he's always gonna be a zucchini he was a zucchini <laughs> yesterday he'll be a zucchini tomorrow <laughs> you can't change the key. Sorry. <laughs> but keep coming by. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you want to keep paying us. And that's what the doctor says. Like, hey, by the way, your money's not good here. The moms are paying us with cash. You have too much money. Yeah, your checks aren't valid I don't here. buy it. I've been to the hospital. They take all Mostly your money. ones. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly ones. <laughs> Don't need your pennies. <laughs> and Sunny thinks that's weird that she's paying these bills in cash. She's like she's so poor and barely even be able to afford food. Like how how she, she paying this <laughs> how she paying this hospital bill. So back at the precinct, he tells Tubbs, like, hey, don't you think this is weird? <laughs> After we walk in on Tubbs having a serious hard time with that pencil sharpener. <laughs> he needs an electric one. <laughs> he spent all his money on it. I wish you guys just the picture for a moment. They're filming this. The director behind the camera. They have the all, everyone who's on the crew, and they're like, okay, Sonny, you walk in. Everyone else, act like, you, <laughs> act like you're doing office work. And they're like, okay, he comes, struggling to use the pencil like, sharpener. The pencil, like, what's with you? Why would you sharpen it? <laughs> so, so was this stage? Was he playing on that? Or was he rushing to get his pencil sharpened so he could pretend like he was doing office work? <laughs> So that when they film Sonny coming in, he's yeah, like, busy that... doing work. <laughs> Sharpening pencils is, is, is office work, apparently. <laughs> or it's like some inside joke that PMT did with the camera people. Like, okay, I'm supposed to be doing office work. Yeah. And I'm like, struggle with this pencil sharpener on my desk. <laughs> so this so is he... where things start to get a little convoluted for me. Maybe this family just doesn't want the dirty cop's money. They want to pay for their own kid's health. And then things kind of start to unravel as we start to find out the truth behind the murderous 13-year-old that Sonny rescued us from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's from Chicago. <laughs> that right there. <laughs> They head over to the ATF and yeah, they talk dude. to the ATF agent. And he says, yeah, the prince matched somebody. These guns were stolen from Baltimore, but they matched someone, but not that person. Well, yeah, they basically said that that person doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Oh, so Jeffrey's alive. We get the whole <laughs> breakdown scene. We get that whole breakdown scene. Crockett's informing the whole gang. It turns out this 13-year-old gang-banging ringleader is running this whole gun show uh, and he's got a murder on his name and he's hiding low with Bing, Bing and, his, and, and Anita they're, they're his employees see <laughs> now we're starting to get it this is an awful lot like that episode of the Simpsons where they get arrested and Bart is the one that ends up taking all the blame by the mobsters <laughs> after Sonny learns none of this is matching up there's something up with little Jeffrey who I shot and almost murdered he barges into the church where Annette and Monroe are having like a service for their almost dead son and Sonny just calls them out in the middle of the church and tells us like whoa hey man like well, maybe, maybe you let's get to somewhere else <laughs> maybe not the funeral <laughs> At the precinct, Dad confirms, like, what you're saying, John, is that Jeffrey is a runaway. His name is Gordon. He's from Chicago. And he is, they use him for murdering and all the other crimes because he doesn't have a record and it will, it won't uh, um, indict the other adults that that are mixed up in this. Yeah, they're never going to convict a 13 year old. So now we have a, we have a great driving scene with, with Tubbs telling Sonny, I love you, man. Don't do anything crazy in here. Don't do what I know you're going to do, which is bust in guns blazing and put us all in danger. I but, love you. But also, I did think when I thought you were dead in the beginning, I thought, who gets the car? <laughs> <laughs> and Annette, Monroe is beating her up again. Yeah, bad. Yeah, real bad. And he says that he knows that it's Annette's fault. 
that the first gun deal went through and that Sonny found out about Jeffrey, that his name is actually, um, sorry, I just forgot it. Gavin? No. Uh, uh, Gordon. There we go. Gordon. And that Sonny found yeah, out well, about I mean, what we're seeing is we're seeing now that Gordon's in the hospital, all, you know, shot up from Crockett. Now, Ving is getting all kind of power hungry, trying to step in on uh, <laughs> Gordon's gang. <laughs> He starts beating her up real bad. He's going to kill her. She stabs him in the leg, and he runs off. She passes out. She wakes up at the hospital, and the duo are talking to her, and she comes out with it like, she doesn't have a son. That's, yes, it's Gordon. Uh, she just always did whatever Monroe said because she was afraid. She knew that he knew that she was mixed up with Holiday, too, so like this, he had this connection with her, and that Monroe is going to But Gordon her. was the ring leader. Gordon was calling all the shots. <laughs> shot caller. 13-year-old shot caller. No, but she, she did say that he would have killed her. She said that that she was afraid of both of them, that he was going to shoot her. But she does know. In the end, Crockett's been feeling guilty this whole time, but it, he actually shot a criminal. Yeah, yeah, that's technically true. Someone who's actually murdering people and doing these and stuff. Yeah, if he had to shot him, then he would have shot him. That's why he stuck the gun out there. I, I know he was just trying to shoot a 13-year-old. But um, <laughs> what he bargained for. <laughs> so now the whole vice team is off to go run off to find out. They know now where Monroe is. They're going to go run off and stop this arms deal, apparently, that they didn't know about up until they talked to Annette in the hospital. The whole team is there. They come running in. The arms deal is in the middle. They don't announce themselves. They don't do anything. No, they do announce themselves. That's what starts it. Gina yells out, Miami Vice free. <laughs> That's <laughs> announcing yourself. <laughs> Oh, so she does her job. Okay. Yeah, she does her job. Yeah, from, from far away, you hear Gina say, Miami Vice Freeze, and then they start shooting at them, and then there you go. That's all. That's all. all. <laughs> Huge shootout starts. People start dropping all over the place. And then, oh, yeah. Oh, they start dropping teens. It's the D.A.R.E. program. <laughs> hey, look at Trudy. She's running in in high heels with that mini skirt. Chasing after people, shooting people. So he can't even catch Monroe as he runs up the stairs to the top of that gas tank. He, he can't even get there in time as he's having flashbacks to seeing what happened when he walked in on them the first time at the very beginning of the episode. There's a small explosion of a flare coming in. Monroe starts to fall off the roof. He's hanging on the ledge. So he's having this flashback. He's still not even all the way up the stairs yet because he's winded. <laughs> Meanwhile, Trudy's running people down in six inch heels. <laughs> He gets uh, to the top because of the flashback. He's too slow uh, getting to the roof, and Monroe falls to his death. Now, come on. It won't get real close. I want to, okay, let's close the seal off. <laughs> okay, we're in our secret. It's just us inside of this room. We all believe Sonny let this man die to yeah, purpose, of course. right? <laughs> he didn't even really reach for him. He like, went there and looked at him. Yes. <laughs> yes. What I'm more concerned over is the fact that. We had a bust just short, uh, just a few scenes ago that went very well. Very successful bust. This one, not so much. Lots of dead <laughs> teenage gangbangers. Uh, Monroe went splat. They're never going to find out where the guns were actually coming from now. There is something in common with when the Vice team, uh, when these situations end in bloody everyone dies, and then when they actually do good police work and get things right. It's like there's one cop that's, if you took him away, uh, would make the difference. I just want to say that I think it's, Tubbs this beard distracting the entire team. <laughs> yeah. No one can focus. You got that leather jacket. You just, I mean, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? You, 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 too much at one time, PMT. <laughs> too much at one time. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> We're going to have a really fast scene before we get to the final scene of the episode. So we're going to with them murdering the perpetrator. But no, we have a couple scenes left. He didn't murder him. He fell in <laughs> Come on, come on. We're still in the bubble. It's safe in here. No, you guys are so dramatic. He's gone. Oh, well. No one's going to miss him. The wife here. Sorry. Did you slip and fall? <laughs> Sandy stops off to see Gordon. He gives him, like, he starts talking to him. He's questioning whether or not if Billy is better off without him. I mean, we all know. Gordon, you shot me, asshole. <laughs> I, I love how love how he's apologizing to the gangbanger he shot <laughs> yeah, for being a crappy dad to little Davy. <laughs> 
And in the last moment, you see Gordon squeeze Sonny's hand. He's not dead. He's going to be okay. He's no zucchini. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the final scene of the episode, we have Sonny now driving like 100 miles an hour down the freeway with little Billy sitting on his lap with no seatbelt on. Also creepy. <laughs> <laughs> He's telling him, like, I don't care about your new daddy. I'm not letting him adopt you. Sorry. No, and I, I know I'm not the perfect dad, but I just know that I always did my best and by I'm not kidding. coming around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was right, okay? He can't keep witnesses protected. Help me protect his kids. <laughs> uh, look, at, look at what happened to Tubbs, baby. <laughs> hey. I don't think Billy actually likes to drive the car. I, no, I think Billy's really just doing it for his dad. <laughs> so um, I also like how Crockett's telling him, like, make sure you always remind Bob, you know, he's not your real dad. I am, you know, because he knows he's being replaced. You know, there's going to be a time in the near future when Barry is going off to college <laughs> that Bob's going to pay for and he won't even be invited for, for the graduation or anything. So... <laughs> And that's the end of this episode by promising Billy he'll call him every once in a while. <laughs> so, so, you think it would have been easier if they had just made uh, Billy Gordon? <laughs> he just accidentally shoots his own kid. Like, then they, like, like he dies and he's off the show. <laughs> My son was in a, a <laughs> house. <laughs> well, let's go talk about this week's music because it's it's because it's like it's been so far this season. One new one, one we've talked about a bunch. Let's go break down this week's music. All right, John. So like I mentioned, one new one, one old one. But the old one can't be one we've talked about more than once right unfortunately yeah so this is one of the many 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 times we're gonna get you two um <laughs> we get you two's race against time so obviously you two formed in dublin ireland in 1976 they actually got signed by island records in 1980 after they won a local talent show which on a side note I just want to mention, in Ireland, in 1980, they win a talent show and got a record contract. I am just picturing this as like <laughs> one of those movies, you know? There's the loud American in the small Irish village, you know? Uh, they're at, at the pub. You know, that was so good, I'm going to sign you to my label. <laughs> they're challenging the jocks who have no sleeves yes. on, and one of them is really dumb. <laughs> you two made up of Bono, Edge, and, you know... Those other guys. So <laughs> let's uh, go ahead and talk about those other guys a little bit. Since we will be talking about you two again, we'll, we'll wait and we'll talk about Adam Clayton later. Let's talk about Larry Mullen Jr. Larry is the drummer. He's recorded 14 albums with the band. And little do people know that U2 was originally the Larry Mullen Band. That's what it was during the talent competition. That's what it should have stayed after the talent competition. I'm just saying, Larry Mullen <laughs> is U2. And I mean, why wouldn't I think Larry Mullen is the band? He is listed by Rolling Stones as the 96th greatest drummer of all time. That's 96th. pretty generous. Come on now, come, come hey, on. Hey, uh, he. Come on. I'm not. Hey, come on. Ninety six. He earned ninety six. Man, he's not. It's not like he's some Stephen Adler. Who was ninety eight, by the way? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, he's not Meg White from the White Stripes, who was ninety four. Wow, wow. I mean, but. U2 is known for their <laughs> drumming, too. I mean, it's just like the Beatles. The Beatles are known for having these amazing drum sets. It's like it breaks in the middle of these songs with this uh, uh, unforgettable drumming that happens. Hey, man. Hey, Larry is slightly better than Cindy Blackman, who was the drummer <laughs> for Lenny Kravitz for many years. <laughs> the fact I had to 
to explain that. <laughs> okay, so Larry, the drummer, uh, some of the stuff he's done outside the band. In 90, he co-wrote and arranged the official Republic of Ireland national football team song called Put Em Under Pressure. So a little soccer reference there. <laughs> uh, Mullen and and bandmate M. Clayton, who we'll talk about next time, also recorded a soundtrack to the 1996 uh, movie Mission Impossible, which featured Vin Rames. Hey, we're, <laughs> we're, we're tying everybody together here. <laughs> so, boy, do I hope that Andrew Clayton did more than just that, because, of, uh, man, is it going to suck having to talk about him next time. <laughs> Larry Mullen has also acted in a couple movies. In 2011, he was in Man on a Train with Donald Sutherland. And in 2013, he was in A Thousand Times Good Night, which actually won the Grand Prix at the Montreal World Film Festival that year. So, now that we talked about the great Larry Mullen of the Larry (laughs) Mullen Band, we're going to talk about the song The Dream by Albert Collins, Robert Cray, and Johnny Copeland. All three of those men I just mentioned put together an album in 1985 called Showdown. It actually won a Grammy. The song The Dream was on that. All three of them were blues artists. And at the time, all three of them were signed to Alligator Records, which actually Alligator Records is a legitimate company and is still in business today. I, I will explain all that in a minute. So, we'll start with Albert Collins. Albert Collins uh, was a blues singer, songwriter, and Texas guitarist. And actually one of the a more influential blues Texas guitarists in that he was a big inspiration to guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimmy Ray Vaughan. Uh, and Jimmy Vaughan. To get into a little bit about Albert Collins, so in the late 50s, he started uh, recording, but didn't make a whole lot of waves until we got closer to, uh, until we got into the 70s. In fact, even though he was uh, regularly performing through the 60s, by 71, he was 39 and working construction jobs. He worked as a paint mixer, a truck driver, and even worked one job that was a remodel for Neil Diamond. His wife finally talked him into the late 70s, so going back and just focusing on music. To actually see quite a bit of, uh, he would see a lot more success going into the 80s, including the album Showdown. He's considered the master of the Telecaster, and in 1987, even appeared, made a cameo appearance in The Adventures of Babysitting. He performed in until the early 90s and uh, eventually passing away. But he is considered a, a blues legend. Now, Robert Cray is another accomplished blues singer and guitarist. He started in the 70s, and actually, Albert Collins was one of the guys influence, who influenced him. He was also known as Night Train Clemens. It's too hard to keep track of how many night trains there are. <laughs> they should have where they all get together. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I feel like you have to, like, there's some kind of secret handshake that tells you, like, okay, <laughs> he must be a night train. <laughs> so, good old night train. He's actually a five time Grammy Award winner, including from one from Showdown. So, in the late 70s, he formed the Robert Cray Band in Eugene, Oregon. He played a bunch of college towns and was actually uncredited as the bassist in the band Otis Day and the Knights from the National Lampoon's Animal House in 1978. (laughs) So when you're watching National Lampoon's and you see the band, he is the bassist. That is Robert Cray. Damn. And he's played with all kinds of people. He was a part of Stevie Ray Vaughan's last performance, which was with Buddy Guy and Eric Clapton. He was invited by Keith Richards to join the backing band for Chuck Berry in the 87 moot film Chuck Berry, Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll. And he was abdu- inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame in 2011. So then we get to Johnny Copeland. Johnny Copeland was also a Texas blues guitarist and singer. And in 1983, he was Blues Entertainer of the Year. He is also the father to blues singer Shamika Copeland. Johnny Copeland was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame in 2007, the posthumously, but his first record debuted in 1956. 
He toured for two decades to eventually make enough of a name to move to, uh, that he moved to New York City and then saw his most success during the 80s before health problems would eventually end his touring. And I mentioned earlier that I know that Alligator Records still exists. <laughs> Why do I know Alligator Records still exist? Because Johnny Copeland was on was signed with Alligator Records, and then after he passed it away, they signed his daughter Shamika Copeland, ah. who I believe is still signed to Al- Alligator Records and is an up and coming blues artist. There you go. There are three blues artists that make up the song that we know as the Dream. Damn you, Miami Vice, making me learn about the blues. <laughs> 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 Well, John, I hope you're ha- I hope you're happy that you got your wish that we have to talk about the blues on a consistent basis on this podcast. Because otherwise, I would never talk to you about the blues because I'm not much of a blues fan. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and, and I really want to talk about it more. Like, I want to get into more about the Texas guitarists and and what that means as far as like is going for the blues. But I'll I'll, I'll leave it aside. At least I got to talk about guys like Al Collins. And Johnny Copeland. And we got to learn more about the Larry Mullen Band. So, uh, who we'll talk about again eventually. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I don't know where everyone stands. So, I'm, I'm actually really interested to hear where everyone stands on this episode. Let's go break this one down for the last time. All right, John. Why don't you start us off this week? What are your final thoughts on this episode? I'm kind of middle of the road with this episode. I mean, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. A little touchy feely. We got to see Crockett his kid, and I give him a lot of crap because we ne- he never sees his kid. <laughs> so at least he went and saw his kid. I have to give him that much. Other than that, I mean, like I said, you know, it was it was a feely episode. I enjoyed having Ving Rhames back. It wasn't a bunch of drugs and hooker action, and you know, I mean, even the gun action was kind of reserved. And, and I get it. They were talking about kids being used, and it was a rip from the headlines as far as gangs in the eighties and using kids like that. So, but as far as the episode goes, like I, I just. It's not good. It wasn't bad. You know, there were things I liked about it. So, but yeah, I'm just kind of middle of the road there. I kind of want to see Crockett get a win. I feel like like now I, I'm starting to feel bad for him. Well, I so I'm on the fence with this episode. I and for me, it's not like middle of the road. It's like good versus great because I actually really enjoyed this episode and they do hit some heavy punches. In this, it's a little off for me that the emphasis is on teens getting away with heavy crimes and then the headlines of the 80s being about how kids should, there should be a harder stance on kids committing crimes. And I'm surprised that that's what the emphasis was to this episode, that it wasn't excessive police force, which is what I thought it would be. But it's the rip from the headlines aspect is that teenagers were committing worse crimes and they should be treated as such. And it kind of goes on a little bit rant for me that I'm not going to go down about children being tried as adults. That's a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time for that. But I thought this episode was good. There was a coherent story. I'm excited. He went back and saw Sammy, Timmy, Jimmy, Billy, Billy. They went and saw Billy. Uh, Caroline, and- just say Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason he went back. And then also that he didn't just immediately get welcomed back in. Like he has to earn his time back with his son. And it is a really heavy, sunny episode. So, you know, I could go for some more vice team members being in, like being more involved. But also, this is the first episode we've had in a few weeks where it's been actual gunfights. Remember last week, the only time a gun was fired was in the air as they splashed them with the boat. So, <laughs> true. <laughs> Very so true. I this was, <laughs> so I thought this was a really good episode. I liked it a lot. I liked the rip from the headlines aspect. I liked what the topics that they decided to tackle. So I thought it was good. How about you, Melissa? Um, I gotta say, I don't. I did not see the whole aspect that you're talking about with like they were saying that kids should be punished more. I thought they were trying to like they were speaking so sorry for him because he was a kid and he was a runaway. Um, I liked the episode. No, Gordon was the ringleader. Didn't you hear? <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't believe anything you say, John. So. <laughs> he um, was pimping out that chick. He had Ving scared of a. I mean. Yeah, no, that's not what was going on. <laughs> anyway, no, they, they made it clear that I thought they made it clear, like when they talked about him, that yeah, it's, you know, it's sad that they're runaways and that they 
they use them and abuse them and it doesn't matter if they die and or they go they won't they're not gonna charge them so i mean i don't know i like i like i said i did not see that aspect of it where they were like basically saying that they're soft on teen criminals i do like the episode um I'll, i mean i love tubs in the episode <laughs> <laughs> um, a soft on teen criminals shoot them <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Soft on him, shoot. <laughs> um, I know I liked it. It was a good episode. I liked I liked the fact that they brought back his son and his son. I guess you can ex wife, his ex wife, you know, even he's talking his wife all the time. And that does open the door that they will be coming back more. So you will be you will see more of Billy. His name is Billy. <laughs> see, I, I hope he doesn't drive on his dad's lap. They're gonna bring back Jesse. <laughs> Whoever that is. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't get tough, this boy. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. You can find show notes. You can find how to subscribe, how to support us, a link to that Patreon. We would still love your support. You can find all of that on our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. See you all next time. Bye, pals.